The Carleton College Convocation Program is a weekly lecture series that brings fresh insights and perspectives from experts in a variety of fields. The program has a rich history dating back several decades. The selected convocation speakers assist the liberal arts mission of centering thoughtful conversations within education and beyond. to today's convocation with people you, um, my name is Tin Nguyen. And my name is Amanda Ko, and we are board members of the Coalition of Southeast Asians on campus. So a year ago, I saw a photograph of a man um, holding presumably his daughter as she lay peaceful, peacefully floating in a pond filled with lotus flowers. The serene and dreamlike image felt familiar yet macabre at the same time. This, prom this prompted me to look further into the talent that captured the scene. And as I was in awe kind of looking through Mr. Wing Yui's work, I found out that he was a Carleton alum, class of 83. And my jaw dropped when I found out that he was an economics major here. While currently a professor of photography at Oberlin College, Mr. Wing Dui's background extends beyond the realm of photography alone. Before embracing teaching and photography as his life's work, he embarked on a captivating journey. From spending time living with Buddhist monks in India to immersing himself among um, emerging artists in New York City, photography, in his own words, became a certain language, a medium in which he can communicate and tell his stories. This passion led him to pursue a Master of Fine Arts at the University of New Mexico. Following his studies, he has embarked on numerous projects, including the East of Eden, which is a decade-long multi-series project which, with, ha with stage narratives in the green landscapes of Vietnam and the United States to represent humanity in the post-apocalyptic events in their respective sites. Mr. Nguyen Yui has been the recipient of many awards and fellowships, including the Guggenheim Fellowship in 2011, the American Photography Institute's National Graduate Fellowship, just to name a few. And his work has been exhibited in public collections around the world, including the United States, Europe, Asia, South America, with recent article publication in Bomb Magazine and Sachar publication. So. Without further ado, yes. please join us in welcoming Pippo Nguyen for today's convocation. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. And you know, um, I had a whole talk planned around this until I arrived yesterday and realized I have to really change it because this being here, smelling the familiar smell, something so wholesome about multi meal. And, um, <clears throat> and, and just be, to be able to walk around town a little bit, it's about, so I, I, I guess I, I try to change my talk and thinking about as I'm retracing my steps, um, what did I leave behind? What did I come here with? Um, and, and what do I take with me? So my talk is gonna be focus a little bit on my earlier work, which deals heavily with identity, as you can see, as you will see why. Um, some friends have asked me, do you know what? Why is this title A Dust of Life? A Dust of Life is actually a pretty negative connotation within the Vietnamese community. It you know someone without a home, someone who's just floating around life. And for me, it's a fit title for the talk and also how I see myself as someone who have consciously decided to embrace a dust of life as a philosophy, as a way of life. And instead of making it a negative connotation, I want to empower myself with that notion. This is a, a photograph of my studio. And in order to begin this talk today, I want to provide you with a context, because I guess context is everything. <clears throat> First, I want to thank, thank Carleton College, the Convocation Committee, and the Alumni Office 
I want to thank the kindness and the support of my class, the class of 83. And I want to give a huge shout out to Miranda Field, who, without having met her, I would never get to do what I'm doing now. And of course, Professor Eleanor Zelliot, who has provided a nurturing environment, who has given me a good education on what India was about and then how she fostered my sort of desire to see the world and to travel. And to my grandparents, Francis and Orville Hognander, that's my step-grandparents who live in Edina. That's one of the main reasons why I actually came to Carlton, um, is to be with them. So thank you to all of you guys who have given me a voice to talk about and to tell my story. Context. When I came here um, to America as this young boy here, when I was 13 years old, um, fresh there, I had a life beforehand. Um, before I came to America, I had a promising career in table tennis. I'm, I'm gonna say it like that's too loud. Um, but I was a national athlete. I was in many ways geared up for my career there. Um, and my family situation is quite complicated. My mom was a spy. She actually spied for the nationalists against the French and the collaborators, whereas my dad was a collaborator who worked for the French government. However, they were in a prearranged marriage. The day that he came over to take a look at his future wife, she crossed her eyes, made herself as unattractive as possible, and yet he said, well, you know what? You will be my wife. And then the day afterwards, her crew captured him, brought him out to the country to be executed, where she went out and she said, this is going to be my husband. I quit being a spy, let him go. And that's how the love story and the family tension began. <laughs> um, I grew up in this family that was heavily influenced by a French education system. I grew up speaking French. My mom and my dad, they both attended a French sort of education. My mom went to the Paris Conservatory. My dad studied medicine under the French. My sister's name were Mimi, Fifi, and Gigi. And I'm people, yeah. Um, and so having grown up, oops, I, I, we, we, we're not going there yet. That was just gonna be the break from the, the heavy stuff. Um, so, growing up under a French colonial rules, I mean, there's this legacy that's really left, you know, as I was growing up, the color of your skin, the language that you use to communicate, the way that you act, the more westernized you are, the better you are. And then having come here as a Vietnamese refugee, my identity was rightfully so, heavily identified with the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War is intense, I was shot at, I escaped, a bomb dropped on my uncle's house by five minutes, the family perished, I survived. So there were a lot of questions, you know, like what's my purpose, what am I doing? And here I am at 13 years old, I left Vietnam, my dad was stuck in Vietnam, arrived without any sort of map, a map of like what is gonna be happening. So this is, <laughs> this is my freshman year, 1979. And I just want to give you a context, right? So like I arrived here without any map to sort of function in this culture. Um, only having arrived in the US for four years, my English was not really great because I spoke French before. Um, but the atmosphere was extremely exciting. 1977, the Sex Pistol changed everything for us. Um, do you know, so as you can see, there's like a myriad of like influence that I was taking into. You get Blondie, Jimi Hendrix, Foreigner, Cheap Trick. Oh my gosh, such sweet memories. Um, 
And as I was like mentioning, you know, identity, even though it was a privilege for me to attend this institution, the decision of leaving my Vietnamese American community behind in California and not attending UC Berkeley was one of those really incredibly difficult decisions because I arrived into this culture besides my grandmother and my grandfather, I did not have any sort of support, but I found a lot of love and a lot of support here. But there's a collision. Questions such as, who am I? Am I Swedish American? Am I Vietnamese American? Am I Vietnamese? Am I American? These questions, even though it was not visible, it was not concrete, however, it began to surface and percolate in my own psyche. So this, I can talk about this work as a work that I did that dealt with my identity in the US and in the West. On the left is in the West, which is the Renaissance. And then to the right is a project called Another Western, which dealt with my assimilation into the US culture. And then another set of work, especially after 2005, is my work dealing with the nuances and the challenges and of being an outsider returning home. So you know that idea of, you know, when you tell somebody, hey, why don't you go back to where you come from? So the fact of me returning to where I came from and having realized that I'm just so much more foreign there than I am here. So that was my second phase of my research. In my work, people ask me, what kind of photography do you do? What kind of art do you do? It's really difficult because I have been labeled and a landscape photographer, a conceptual artist. I, I actually, I don't think of myself as an artist, really. I mean, that sounds like such an important title. I think of myself as a storyteller. And through my storytellings, I want to ask questions. I constantly ask questions about what, you know, post-colonial issues, what is otherness, what is my identity do have to deal with, you have to do with the war, and how my work is really autobiographically driven. That is, I distill these ideas and issues, maybe not directly, or you know, oftentimes, metaphorically, and try to work through these sort of issues in my sort of visual research. And what I'm really interested in is cultural authenticity, right? It's like, when I go back to Southeast Asia, do I feel authentic? I mean, that's, and, and if I don't feel authentic, when I go back to the US, do I feel more American in the US then, even though my skin color is different? This is my first body of work, years, ages ago before I went to school. As you can see, this kind of, psychically fragmented, very emoti emotional, very expressive sort of self-portrait that began to address this idea of identity. At the time, I was looking at Lucas Amaris, I was looking at Francis Bacon, I was looking at Christian Botansky. These are some of the artists that I was looking at to inform my work. And then everything changes when I came across writing by Margot Machida. She's a curator that worked strictly with Asian American. During that time, Asian American, it's just like a whole new concept because we are not Asian, but we are not American. We are something else, you know? We are like these people who stuck between cultures. There's this liminal spaces, space that we all try to function. And when I speak about these folks, I think of them as my elders, my older brother, my older sister. On the left-hand side is San Quan Chi, and his work dealt with colonizing the West. Everything seems normal, except you see this Chinese ambassador, you know, colonizing. That means the scale of his body is almost like to the scale of like the, of the Statue of Liberty. And the way that he photographed, he has actually imposed himself over that Statue of Liberty. And the other person that I was looking at is Te Ching Xie, who did these one-year performances. 
Um, he would be sitting in this cell being isolated from the world, cannot get out, only have visitors that would bring him food every day for one year. And, you know, he did a performance piece where he tied himself to another artist with a, this eight-piece, uh, eight-foot rope and lived like that for a year. So these are the kind of folks that I was really interested in. And what I was interested in is how do they represent themselves as male, a, the Asian male? How do they deal with gender? Gender representation is really complicated when you are a male in this particular, you know, in, in, in this particular culture. I can talk a little bit about that. And then through Margot Machida, at some point, it was such an honor for me to be graced on her cover, you know, with my work. This particular work is called um, Susanna and the Elders. So as an Asian male in the West, we have to deal with this two strange stereotype. One is that you are a kick-ass kung fu master. And secondly, is you are a waif-like submissive gender. And then I began to read Yukio Mishima's writing, and his work dealt so much with his body, um, he chose an extreme form to express his manliness, even though, you know, he's a queer artist. Um, at the height of his physical beauty, he committed suicide um, just to demonstrate uh, the kind of strength and the kind of commitment, I think, to like his work. And then I came across this work by John Thompson, who photographed condemned criminals in China during the 19th century. And this metaphor, this condemned criminal, was a perfect metaphor for me to think about someone who is suspended between two cultures, the East and the West, marginalized, condemned by the East, and being watched, having gaze upon by the West. And so this was my first sort of serious project. It's called A Thousand Deaths, where I play these roles of the condemned criminals someone that is suspended between two cultures um, that is being gazed upon by the West, as in the gallery viewer, as in like the collector, as in the general viewers that I was talking about, thinking about, and of course being ostracized from like your own culture. And this is when I began to investigate the idea of authenticity. What does it mean by like being authentically Asian? Right, not about v being Vietnamese, but about being Asian. So I went to a Chinese restaurant and I asked some lady to scribble something down for me and then I copy it. I don't think it looked like anything, but somehow people were convinced that this is some sort of Asian, you know, writing. So the idea of forging, you know, of fabricating my identity and you know, forging and making fake sort of art became like this huge interest of mine as a, you know, as a metaphor for how I was trying to assimilate myself into this culture. This is a sketch, I think it's really funny, or it's just something that I did in between. It's called, you know, the, the last Chinese takeaway where Christ opened up the fortune cookies. The, the image is kind of faded, so, you, so I have to describe it for you. And Judas, you know, amongst, he's sitting on the, on the edge there, he's pulling out his wallet. He's the only one who's in black. He doesn't have any hair. He's bald, he's Asian, while like, the table is completely littered with two gold boxes and cans of Budweiser. It was just a sketch. It was a funny thing. <clears throat> and going back and being committed to like this particular project called assimilation, and a lot of people try to correct me on this spelling, but I, actually it's mandate. It's, is to simulate. So my idea is like, do you know what? If I'm fully assimilated into the West, what are people going to be looking at? Would they be looking at like this toll right here where you tip it up like this? And that's a sign, it's a signifier for someone who has become completely Westernized. So I call this a tragic comedy because no matter how difficult, how hard I try, it will never work. So looking at Renaissance, Art, I thought it was just a perfect vehicle for me to think about my place and where do I belong in this grand narrative of the West. 
again, playing with that conflict using Asian theater gestures. I play both male and female to talk about that complexity of being that dual gender, very masculine and very feminine. I mean, I don't want to use that kind of backwards sort of description, but it's the only one that I can think of. Um, so one is aggressive and one is submissive. Can somebody be Perseus and Medusa at the same time? And then this is one of my, my interpretation of um, Gabrielle Destre and one of her sisters. This is a pretty classic, you know, classic painting. I just thought it's just like such a super weird painting, so I had to do this one. Um, and then on the left-hand side, we have Madonna and Child, which is uh, an image that I made when my son, Asia, was born. This was made in graduate school. He was three months old, so I say, why not? You know, thank God gave me a prop for myself, so it's, <laughs> it's awesome. <clears throat> That's, you know, and you're gonna see, I use my kids a lot, you know, um, as they keep growing. And then on the right-hand side is Mercury. You know, so you have that male body, you playing that Mercury, the strong, but like you on this, you know, Mercury's on the, these kind of spring shoes that you know as soon as he hops off, he's gonna collapse and hit his face somehow. So I thought about these uh, as performance, as theater, um, and then these frame, they're pretty ornate. I mean, they're large, they're about like 30 by 40, and they have these ornate frames that just signify these kind of cultural Western kind of, you know, uh, relics. And of course, about identity, about faking, about like trying to fit in, and then using prosthetic, of course, to use to kind of reconstruct a nose that's more Western than anything else. Um, so that's, yeah, my projects that deal with my sort of assimilation into the West. Then I moved to Oregon, and this began my sort of quest to make work that would correspond and would address the geographical, cultural, historical significance of a place. So going out west and living there up in the northwest, I sort of like was intrigued by this incredibly violent history of Asian immigration. Um, I found out, I did research, um, found out a lot of sort of violence that were committed against these folks. Um, when they discover mine, how some town would get together and eliminate these Asian miners and take over the mine themselves. So I thought, do you know what? If I look for like 19th century representation of these Western miners, maybe I will find some. And like, it's really difficult. What I found was images of Asian as prostitutes, as opium addicts, as coolies. And you know how representation is everything, you know? So I want to subvert that. I want to change that history I want to change that cultural practice and to pose some questions, you know? Can we reinvent history? And so, <laughs> with this work, I became the cowboy, uh, playing the various roles, the boxer, the, the real General Lee, um, and even Jang and Ike, the famous Siamese twins, the gambler and such. And through this process, it was like really incredible um, for me to discover do you know what, it's not like I just like the work. I, I usually don't look at my work that often, but I like the process. During this process that um, I was able to meet a lot of really incredible people, including this woman named Rose, who took most of these photographs. She was so well-researched and she was so incredibly kind. She ran one of those old time photo places and she would kick her customers away so that she can work with people. So it was really amazing. We end up having this beautiful connection where Rose would take me and my sons fishing. Um, and so that's what I really like about photography is that it has given me a mean to get to know the world and to engage with the world and how to be a little bit more critical and how to frame the, you know, what I see around me. And then I was awarded with this really an honor to receive this award from the Lila Wallace Foundation. My proposal was I'm gonna stage the seven samurai as they like 
having a beat down with the magnificent seven in Monet's garden. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I like to engage folks, you know, to talk about like these issues, East versus West, in a more comical way. I feel like that's the way for me to invite folks in besides making the work beautiful and seductive. Um, some of these issues, I just found it is too heavy for, for it to be, you know, to, to kind of kind to invite your viewer. Um, but with this particular body of work, since this is my opportunity to go and live in Monet's garden, I thought, you know what? It should be a political gesture because I am an ex-colonial subject. What should I do? I'm gonna go ahead and liberate France, steal everything as if they did it to Vietnam. So metaphorically, me and my family, which is two little kids and my wife, um, we staged this colonial expedition to France from like Vietnam to liberate and to steal the whole cultural relic and bring everything home for our natural history museum. Same practice, right? I mean, we all know like that practice of liberating, you know, like the pyramids or whatever and bring it over to England and showing your folks. So with this particular project, I, I went a little bit crazy. I made this, uh, it's based on this idea, this book uh, from uh, Talbot called The Pencils of Nature, where he just went to his garden and just picked samples and just make these sun prints. So with that, I liberated um, that idea, that's the tool. I would get up early in the morning before the gardener, Mr. Um, well, before the gardener arrived at six o'clock, I would get up, I would go out and liberate all the specimens that I can for the day from Givagny. And along with that, I collected soil samples, water samples, and earth samples. And with the 1,200 prints, I have an installation. Oh, this is some samples of these beautiful specimens that I have gathered. Um, my process was interesting, you know, um, get up early, having my son who were like three months, who was three months old you know, on my back, I would just go out, pick these little flowers before Mr. Vahe arrived. And then I would come home, coat the cyanotype, wait for it to dry. By noon, I would begin to make exposure of the specimen on site. And this is one of the version of like this installation, the idea of just covering everything just like in this blue, thinking about how do you actually steal this place. So for me, it's about all those samples. If I really wanted to, we Vietnamese can actually grow our own sort of Givagny um, Monet's garden in Vietnam if we just spread in this water, these seed samples and all of that. Going back to Vietnam for the first time um, after I left was an incredible experience. Going back, um, I did not feel like I was. I came home. I actually came back to the hostile kind of like force, right? I mean, I was greeted by North Vietnamese um, at immigration. Um, that's the reason why I became stateless. I became the refugee in the first place. But Photography gave me such a grounding to go through that experience. So the, with this two million steps, which is like the physical measurements of the space in between the US and Vietnam, I did these performances of asking myself, and, and of, as a traveler, as someone who's outside of the culture, of someone who's dressed up as a boat person, who's left Vietnam in shame, who now's becoming a forever tourist, in his own land. Um, this is an image of this boat person standing on the shore of Vietnam looking straight to the US. This is the image, oops. Um, this is an image of myself actually sitting on the Perfume River next to the house that I grew up in. So this was just a various performances through Vietnam. And so I'm just showing you some samples of this work. If you are interested in more, you can always go and see it on my website. 
And then, you know, September 11th happened. I just knew something. I, I start, you know, there's a lot of things that begins to... Um, I have a lot of questions for such as, you know, what happened to my kids now? Would have, they have to experience the same thing as I would have experienced when I was younger? Um, would the landscape become more anxious? Something is about to happen. As you know, when we go to the airport, all of a sudden there's this, you know, we are in orange, red, green. You have all of these codes. All of a sudden, the safety of this Garden of Eden, which I have arrived from Vietnam, is being threatened. <clears throat> so I'm going to read a little bit. Of, you know, I'm going to read my statement on this work here. East of Eden is begin in the U.S. as a series of large stage color narrative photographs that question the historical depiction of the American landscape as the Garden of Eden. The his historical strategy of utilizing the landscape as a metaphor for nationalism and optimism provides the background for my visual thesis. Initially, I was interested in looking at our contemporary American landscape as a garden as a Garden of Eden and reframing it from the post-September 11 perspective. These photographs of, in East of Eden dealt with humanity in the context of the post-apocalyptic landscape. And that's the first image that I made for this um, project, East of Eden. And as you can see, my son grew up. <laughs> So this is Asia, that little boy that was like three months old. Now he's about six or seven in this image. But this is an image of him standing in front of this out-of-control, raging wildfire. It's very similar, I think, formally to Casper Fried David Friedrich painting that addressed the kind of, um, you know, the human in front of the impending doom and like strength and over being overpowered by nature, something that we just don't have any control over. Here's some other examples from that work. This is the beauty. You know, if you see this sort of landscape right here, do you know, you know it's Ohio, it's a little bit more depressing. <laughs> when you see something like this, this is when I make it, when I go out west, back to my home in Ashland in Oregon. It's beautiful, pine trees and everything. But here, this beautiful landscape now is dotted with snipers. And then you can see this lazy boy it's just sitting there, rotted in this, you know, this wood that is just turning from winter to the spring. And then I had this opportunity during the 30th anniversary of the reunification of Vietnam to do this project, which I naively think that it was really good. It's called a motor motorcycle for B, and for this particular project, I was able to raise money and working with my community as a group of people who sponsored this project. This project would, I raised money enough to find a stranger to, and to buy that stranger a motorcycle and together the two of us will travel from the bottom of Vietnam to the tip of north of Vietnam as two long lost brothers who finally get reunited, a metaphor for that reunification. And it actually happened. <laughs> and it was super scary because if you have been to Vietnam, the roads are extremely dangerous. Um, and to travel with someone that you have no idea who that is and who they are was challenging. However, it was the most amazing, magical experience of my life as I was able to learn how to speak Vietnamese again, to see with this stranger, to become a brother with this stranger, and now we still remain friends after all of these years to see the country together for the first time. He has never seen it, and I had never seen it. And together, we travel, smelly, sharing the same seats day after day with each other for the whole month. It was an incredible experience. And so that's when I begin to think about 
my research should really be in Vietnam and it should no longer be in the US. And at, in, in 2005, that's when I was committed to that idea, is to work with folks who actually have been through that landscape, who share the same air, who breathe the same sort of story and legacy as myself to reconstruct these images. This is Lotus Pond. This is actually a series. I mean, this, this is an image of a friend of mine, another motorcycle rider, and his, of his daughter. The idea of one generation just carrying like another generation forward. And while I was traveling and doing this work, I began to document amputees in Vietnam. And when I talk about amputees, I'm talking about the survivors of the war as they were aging. I don't know what drove me to this idea, but I think having grown up with this person, my brother, this is my brother, who lost an arm in Cambodia when he was fighting there, just seeing how he navigates, how he just remained just prideful, how he presented himself normally, how he tried to hide his wound. I wanted to make images to pay sort of like homage and honor to my brother in many sense and to offer these folks a chance to tell their story, which is really almost ignored in Vietnam, you know, during this particular moment in time. So I want to photograph these folks to not to eliminate the wound, but to eliminate the humanity. Here are some images from this series. And this particular photograph is really difficult to make because that man's face, you know, it has been like completely scarred and disfigured. Um, and through this particular project, I found out that some of these folks were in at the same battles together on opposite sides. So that just made it interesting. So I, I had no idea why I was making that work, but I just kept doing it and it was extremely taxing and it was extremely difficult. And I was, you know, almost get arrested a few times, of course. Um, <clears throat> okay. And while working as a Guggenheim fellow to document Vietnamese, Viet, Vietnamese war amputees, I began working on my East of Eden as a new chapter to my ongoing photographic series, East of Eden. This project is my attempt to reclaim my real and imagined childhood memories and fantasies of growing up in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Beyond serving as the mean to tell my stories, I intend for these new images to address issues such as legacy, hope, regeneration. Working with rural Vietnamese children in school uniform, I begin making photographs. Um, I began making portraits and stage photographs reminiscing of 19th century British landscape paintings where the environment and the inhabitants exist in harmony. Against the backdrop of the one scar landscape, my East of Eden is a celebration of the resilience and beauty of humanity. So I have chosen these sites very specifically for that reason. This, these sites, these villages was once, you know, have, were like completely bombarded, was destroyed with Agent Orange during the war, but now everything is grown over, it's beautiful. And I wanted to work with these children as a way to think about what does that look like? How are they gonna build this new Eden if it's just left on their own? On the left-hand side is the left baptism. On the right-hand side is boy with an airplane. As you can see, the legacy, I sometimes I insert little moments and little legacy of the war into these images. And then making this you know, work with this community I worked with this community for a period of close to four years, and it was so incredible to watch these kids from being like young boys and young girls to become like, you know, young men and young women. Um, and while, why one of the reasons why I go back to Vietnam to do my work a lot is that beyond just collaborating with my community, I felt like I was able and I was in a position to give something back 
What does that mean? That means when they work with me, these boys and girls get paid a really fair wage, more than what their parents would get, you know, um, for the day. And all of this money then would go toward the education. That means the money would be going forward for them to buy new uniform, would be buying new books and such, and having watched these folks going from these young boys to, you know, like young men and young girls to like young women, and being a part of the education, it just felt great. And so that's one of the reasons why I keep returning to Vietnam to do work. <clears throat> Okay, and I'm gonna talk about this project as the last project here. It's called My Hotel. And this is how I would just accidentally discover this little hotel room because one day when I tried to check into my hotel room, they said, you know what, we gave it away. So if you don't mind staying in this little tiny one until tomorrow, but I just found it was such a perfect location for me to begin another project quite accidentally. And this project is about, ironically, using this person sitting in the hotel room as a metaphor for someone who is like being completely outside of their culture. The hotel room gave me this perfect commanding view to sort of map what's going on down below, which is like the Vietnamese culture, somehow to find a certain logical pattern there's a desperation to see the culture clearly. As you can see, the curtain is a metaphor. Sometimes it would reveal what's going on outside and sometimes it's partially open and sometimes it's completely covering so that it's just to obscure whatever is going on outside. It's a metaphor for me as someone who's always exists outside of that culture of where I have come from. Just here some images. A lot of time is really frustrating. I mean, I did this project. I stayed in this room about four months, you know, a total of about four months. I would photograph from six o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. It was an idea of performance of like, how far would I stretch? Can I do this for a long time? But as you know, driving after 45 minutes, your brain and just yourself in the same car, you start like seeing things and like hearing things. And that's what happened here, right? It's like every day I would just sit there. I can't go out until 10 o'clock at night. And oftentimes the scene below me, is just empty and boring. You know, it's like, it's not so weird and strange like what I had hoped to be. But in this particular image here, you, as you can see, it's a strange scene. Sometimes I just don't know what's going on and sometimes I do. And it really it reminds me of this project where I just sat and look at this sets of abandoned greenhouses changes throughout the year and throughout the day. And then to see like the little subtle changes to work with limitation as far as, you know, you have only this much to work with what can you do with that particular space? And here are some of these images that I was captured, able to photograph outside of my window. Oftentimes this place is so beautiful and it's so different from like the normal, the everyday Vietnam that folks would bring their subjects and they model in here to photograph. So I was just standing, I was just sitting in my room photographing like they photographed, I guess I was just stealing their photographs. Um, but in the end, what I'm, um, I want to conclude my talk with the idea that, yeah, being in between culture is actually, is not, you know, I, 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 I love it actually, because I'm not bound by any sort of cultural, sort of like rules and, and regulation. I feel like I'm able to move in and out of culture comfortably um, to invent my rules, to, sort of seeing what is really extraordinary by folks that live in that culture every day because from an outsider point of view, these things are not normal. I can pick up slightly everyday details 
and they get magnified into these incredible moments. So that's my, you know, that's a gift that I guess I have from like being in my sort of place um, as someone who exists in between. So that is my conclusion. Uh, we hit 40 minutes. If you have any questions, please ask. Thank you very, very much, people. And yes, we are going to get to the Q&A in just a second. We just have a couple announcements to make. First off, this uh, next week is our last regularly scheduled convocation. That will be with Jill Conklin. That's going to be the food, in, uh, food insecurity uh, convocation. Jill Conklin, Director and Strategic Officer of Food for Soul, an international nonprofit organization founded by Chef Massimo Bottura and uh, Laura Gilmore. That is also the date of Empty Bowls, the 20th anniversary, or 20th Empty Bowls. Uh, this will be instead of the convocation lunch. So next week, no convocation lunch, but we'll have Empty Bowls. And there's much more information on the website. Go to the website, Carlton, type in Empty Bowls 2024. And uh, speaking of which, when you get there, there are ways to participate. There are need, there is a need, excuse me, for about five more people to submit soup. Otherwise, the empty bowls might really be empty bowls, and that would be sad. So if you're able to participate, please go to the website and see how you can get involved. Uh, as far as the post-convo lunch, we had a little bit of a glitch with the RSVP. So if you'd like to attend, we do have a couple seats left. So please see me afterwards. And now, let us get to the Q&A. And I, yep, I saw one hand right back here. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. My name is Eric. I'm a junior political science major from Seattle. Uh, as a student photographer myself, I really enjoyed hearing about your work, learning more about it. I was particularly interested by your use of the specific word authenticity. I know I've had a lot of struggles with that word, and in fact, I describe my own work as the search for something real instead of actually using that word. How, would you, how do you consider the word authenticity, and what do you look for? Thank you. Mm. Wow, you know, that <clears throat> I, I spoke at so many events in, in Asia also and just, you know, mentioned this word, um, authenticity. And, and I think to answer your question, I'm going to not answer it in some ways, I'm sorry, because I think it's, it's one of those things where it's a constant question that changes every day for me as I'm like contemplating on the idea of what's really authentic, right? Um, for me, being, if I'm Vietnamese, does that mean I'm more authentic if I photograph, you know, everyday life in Vietnam? And does that allow for me to go outside of Vietnam and do something else? I think that's something that we struggle with. What does it mean by authentic, you know, authenticity? If you're an Asian American, what do you do work? How, how would you construct your work? Because you're not authentically American or authentically Asian. So that's my question. And I, I don't think I have that answer yet. It's just something that I struggle with. And perhaps you can give me an answer. It would be awesome. Do you have any thoughts? It's very, very, very difficult. And that's why I avoid it in particular. I was recently doing a project overseas. I was in Japan and I had a really, really difficult time taking pictures for six days until one day I went to a flea market. And that is when I felt like I'd really seen what I was there to see. Okay. And so I think there's times when I know that I know what I'm looking for. I, I love street food markets in particular. Those are, some, those are the times that I'm most happy as a photographer. And so I don't have any answers either, but it's maybe a case of you know when you see it. Wow, I'm, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I, I think it's such an evolving question, you know what I mean? So like, I hate those, for those dynamic questions to actually park at like a very concrete answer because I feel like it can shift <laughs> for, it, for each person and like for the work as well. Next. Oh, we got one here. And if I could just ask politely, I'm getting a message from the Zoom Tower. If we could get you a little closer to the mic, please. We're not picking yes. up. Yes, Thank yes. you very much. Hi. Um, I was really struck by your works that um, 
mirrored uh, or subverted like the composition of like canonical European paintings or images. I'm curious about what your motivation in doing that was and how you want your work to speak back to the originals. Do you know, uh, at that time, um, my goal was interesting, be, besides trying to find a place to insert myself into Western myths and culture and trying to find my place in the larger sort of like European classical tradition, I have this idea, maybe like one day, as people go into the museum, they would be just confused between what is the real one and what's the, you know what I mean, what's the fake one? And to really just kind of challenge like institutional practice of having these iconic sort of relics that would define sort of taste and tradition globally, you know? So I think like it's a trope that, I think it was, you know, it began like maybe in the 80s that people, you know, from like uh, a people of color begins to like address using that particular trope. I know like now, you know, it's, it's such a everyday sort of like trope now, but like at the time, it, it was like this new things that people were embracing, you know? It's like you having conversation with the West through these, um, paintings. Did that make, did that answer? Yeah. So this may or may not have been answered uh, through your talk, but when you were at Carleton as a student, how did you, well, could you describe your journey of navigating your in-betweenness between being Vietnamese American and kind of the feeling of in-betweenness between being American and also Vietnamese as well, and at Carlson, yeah, and also like kind of being like you know like quote unquote exile from. Oh, whew. still trying to figure. Do you know what? It, it's so amazing to me. That's why I changed my talk. Actually, I had a whole talk, but then when I came here and trying to confront and trying to see my twenty-one year old self, I had to change my talk because I just felt that you know I, I this I had the safe I had the support. I have the love from like all of my classmates for whatever reason. I don't know why. Maybe I was just like a novelty at the time. You know what I'm saying? But um, <clears throat> but I think it provide especially with someone who did not have the language. I think and then leaving my the community that I had in California, I felt like this was a place. It was. It was nurturing, it was great. However, that's when I have the opportunity to confront all of these questions at once. You know, because back in the 70s, you don't see a lot of these faces. I mean, I mean, you guys, you know? I mean, back in the 70s, I remember the only other sister of mine, you know, when I came in here was like one Vietnamese graduating, and that was it. You know, so like, so that was, you know, it, it really dealt, it really provides an opportunity for me to try to assimilate. Assimilating is not a bad thing. I, I don't think anything's bad. It's just, you do it or you don't, what have you. But like, it just gave me a lot of juice and meat for what I think about now, you know, in terms of identity. But like, I struggle a lot. I mean, the, the, the clear answer is, I struggle a lot when you see like, you know, I'm like the only Vietnamese out there playing broom ball with like a bunch of these big guys. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's, you know, that's tension. I, you know, so anyway. And then I think like in addition to that, I embrace a new culture too, which is the Swedish American culture, you know? So there was a lot of things that was happening at the, that, that particular time. Did I answer your question? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, I would just really love to hear sort of your process seems to be really, really open to curiosity. And okay, great. Very much pursuing your own curiosities. Yes. How have you like fostered that in your process or what is it about you as a person that 
allows you to really go deep into these big what ifs. Do you know, um, thanks, I, you know, with this kind of talk, I always forget I, what I'm supposed to talk about. You know what I'm saying? Because all of a sudden, you know, I'm like a 21 year old kid, like sitting in here, up here being in trouble for whatever reason that I did. But you know, that's a, such a qu great question. For me, when I, you know, with my practice, with like what I think about when I do make visual art is that I think about materials, you know, and how materials communicate ideas. And sometimes I feel like as a person for myself, the way that I work, I have to let go of this idea that you have to create something that's specifically yours and can only be identified as yours. You, I have colleagues who make work that you just look and you're like, oh, you know, for like the last 30 years, you refine on your process. To me, that's really stifling. Yeah, yeah. To me, you know, if you can't grow, if you can't learn about doing something else, I think that's really stifling. So what is my process? My process is I fight with my galleries a lot. You know, my galleries, like, you know, kind of frustrates with me sometimes. Because, you know, you want a certain thing, you know, you want a certain brand and then, and yet you have this, all of this different kind of practice and it's really hard to define you. Um, but I feel like in the end, you, the person who actually, if you committed to that, a, a, a creative person, you have to allow yourself that opportunity to experiment and to fail and like to do strange things. I mean, I've done performances, I've done, you know, I, printmaking, sculpture, installation. Um, I accidentally just get stuck doing photography because, yeah, I teach photography, so that's what I have to pretend like I know. But, um, but yeah, I mean, thanks for asking on that. And I'm just like a great supporter of folks who do things that cannot be identified as like their, you know what I mean? It's like, it's not formulaic, that's what I meant, you know? So as soon as I feel like I'm an expert on that particular thing, I move on. I just completely move on. Even if the work is successful or not, I think just learning is what is driving like my work yeah, and my creative process. Thank you for that question. And we have time for one more question and you get it. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I was just wondering, related to some of the stuff you've been talking about with um, working in relation to like canonical painting or um, also working between like performance and photo, um, how you think about presenting your work in gallery spaces, museum spaces, um, what do you think about when you're installing a show and what do you, um, hope, how do you hope that like the presentation of your work mm. <clears throat> can achieve your goals? Absolutely. That's a, you know, that's really great. And I, I feel like, again, it's context, you know? I mean, I feel like when I show with my commercial gallery, there's a certain things that I really don't have the control over. But, and, and I think it shifts through times and depending on what body of work, um, going back to like the early body of work, and I can tell you, I was very specific about like what should be taken into consideration. You know, I don't want my work to be just on like a, a blank, like a white wall. So, you know, with that assimilation project, I actually have the walls painted yellow. Why not yellow? Why not the color of my skin? So, you know, things are like a little bit more kind of, um, yeah, conceptual that way. But, you know, um, and when I work with curator, with museum folks, like for the lab at the Sharjah Biennale, it was really beautiful to talk and work with these folks. When I was showing like photograph of those kids in the Mekong Delta, they actually found a school for me to show my work and that was really beautiful. It was like amazing. So yes, I told, you know, there's something frustrating for me to not having the full control over the space. Um, at all times, you know? So I just, yeah, it would be like depending on the context. Thank you for that question. And on that, thank you people for being here with us today. Thank you for being here as well. Thank you.